Hello and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live Episode 1, our first settlements. Coming to you from the hilltop in Hamilton, I'm Sean and here with me live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. Welcome everyone to the inaugural episode of Tabletop Bellhop Live. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's night better. Let me put my years of gaming experience event organizing and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to all the visitors in the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch, and it's great of you to join us and take part in the episode. We look forward to seeing you uh, chat along the side of us. Now, we're going to start off with our Tabletop Gaming Weekly. Every show, we like to take a look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. Since this is our first episode, we're going to look back on the last week and what games have hit the ta Bellhop's Tabletop in the last week. Every Monday, I plan to write up a Tabletop Gaming Weekly post over at the blog. That's at tabletopbellhop.com if you haven't been there yet. So I'm going to use this time frame, Monday to Sunday, to answer these questions, even though we're recording on Thursday. So in looking back to the last week, it was a really good week, but an ironically cynical one. Monday night, we have a Monday night game group that comes over. I have five to six friends over at my place down in my gaming dungeon, and we try to play, mostly we play board games. We try to play RPGs, but we can never get everyone together being, you know, middle-aged adults. So this week we start off with Zhang Guo, a really sweet Chinese themed game about the reunification of China, not reunification, sorry, the original unification of China. Um, it's one of the earlier games to use multi-use cards. So you have a card that can be used for different things. It's a very abstract game, but it still manages to pull in the theme. But there's a problem. We played the extreme version. Extreme? Yeah, extreme. Um, <laughs> local parlance, something me and my friends used. I think the first time we coined it, we were playing a game called Ra. The extreme version of the game is when we screw up the rules in such a way that it makes the game way too easy. As an example, I played a game of Terraforming Mars where we each did two actions each and then ended the era instead of going around till everyone passed which meant that we had to substitute in extra cubes because we all had so much money. So we played the extreme version of Zanguo because every time we recruited workers, we recruited them in all five provinces instead of only one. Okay. So we played the extreme version. This happens a lot with our first plays. After Zanguo, my wife asked to play a game of Azul. It's something we've been addicted to lately. We have played a lot of Azul. Anyone who met me at Origins, we tried to teach you Azul, and everyone I taught loved it. Then Thursday, my oldest daughter came to me, asked to play Star Wars Destiny. This is a collectible card and dice game from Fantasy Flight Games. Some of the, the newer hotness, of course, Star Wars licensed. We started off with the base set, so just it's a little base two-player set that you can get really cheap. Played a game of that, and then we broke out some expansions. Uh, we each grabbed a starter set. She grabbed the Boba Fett. She wanted to play the dark side. I grabbed the Luke Skywalker set. We played a game of that. And then we tried to make our own decks, and here's where things got a little bit disappointing. You would think from Fantasy Flight that having the two-player starter set, a single-player starter set, for one player, a single starter player starter set for another, and two booster packs would be enough to make a tournament legal deck? Well, no. Okay, let me correct that. It's enough to make a tournament legal deck, but not two, so not one for each of us. I was Ouch. able to make a really cool Han Solo Lou Skywalker deck. She wanted to make a Kylo Ren um, mental... Darth Vader? <laughs> No, close Tarkin, Grand Moff Tarkin deck. She wanted a Kylo Ren, Grand Moff Tarkin deck. And with all those cards, we could not do that. So I'm slightly disappointed in Fantasy Flight. I know they're known for this. I know they're trying to make money selling their collectible game. But having bought three starter sets and three booster packs, you would think that would be enough for two people to play. That's a big investment to not be able to uh, have two people play a, a tournament deck. Yeah, exactly. If I had bought them all for myself, sure, I could have mixed the decks together, her cards with my cards. There would have been enough neutral cards that I could have made a good deck. So G was a little bummed out by that, and I couldn't convince her to play another game. We were like, hey, let's play anyway. She was a little down on it. Hopefully, we'll get her back into it. Uh, that was Thursday. So on to Friday, uh, there's another couple, local couple, Tori and Kat, that come over to her house, and we are playing what was the number one board game in the world, which is Pandemic Legacy. 
Um, now, so legacy can, games like, are different, right? Legacy, legacy means something specific for games. Yes, uh, it's something new that started with Risk Legacy was the first game to do it. What a legacy game means is that as you play, you make permanent changes to the actual game. That usually involves writing on things, putting down stickers, or ripping things up. In the case of Pandemic, it involves all three. That so gets expensive. what happens is, yeah, <laughs> well, no, you buy the game once. Pandemic Legacy specifically, you are going to play the game a minimum of 12 times because you play through an entire year, January through to December. If you ever fail, you get to play the month again. So while playing it, the most you'll play is 24 games. The least you'll play is 12. Now, yeah, I know a lot of people that are upset about this fact of Legacy games and don't like the fact they have a disposable game but I own a lot of games and I will fully admit there are not a lot of those games that I have played 12 times, let alone 24 times. If I get a game to the table 12 times, I am perfectly happy with any amount of money I've spent on it. To me, that's money well spent. So that's a, so it's a game. It's a gamer's game. It's maybe not the casual gamer's game. You're not going to be playing this like monopoly as a family game night over and over again for the, the average, the average family. Whereas a gamer might play something 12 times. I know my family's pulled out the Monopoly or the Snakes and Ladders a couple of couple of dozen times. True, true. Like, yeah, it depends on the game. For a legacy game, it's definitely more of a gamer's thing. And for any RPG role-playing game fans, they'll get it. It's a campaign. You are going to play a campaign arc. And when you are done that campaign arc, you move on to something else. With Pandemic Legacy, that something else is Pandemic Legacy Season 2. So yes, the game designers and marketers have a good thing going here, right? And then next year you'll buy Pandemic Legacy Season Three, and so on. Yeah, it's it's some of it's marketing. I, I will admit it's marketing. To me, it's good marketing. Risk Legacy blew my brain when we played that the first time. We're like, oh my god, this is awesome! And I have to say, the first time you rip up a board game piece, a card, it's it's very freeing. There's and a lot of times in the in life and Monopoly, I've wanted to rip up cards, so I can understand that. <laughs> True enough. You're going to make your own version. It'll be a Monopoly Legacy Edition, and by the end, there'll be five properties left, and that's it. It'll be post-apocalyptic. There we go. <laughs> so anyway, we play Pandemic Legacy on Friday night, so we tried to. We played three months. We played October, the second week, which means we failed once, and we failed. Then we played the first part of November, and we failed. Then we played the second part of November and failed again. That was depressing. What that meant is we have failed four games in a row. So going back to the legacy thing, when you start playing Pandemic Legacy, and note this is not a spoiler, don't turn us off, we're not going to spoil anything. This is right in the main rule book. You put a sticker on a box that says, when you lose four games in a row, open this box. We call that the box of shame. We had to open the box of shame. So it was a downer of a night, I will admit. But you know what? It was still fun. It was an experience. It was awesome hanging out with Tori and Kat. Uh, we had a good time. We just didn't have fun, which is an interesting thing to note about this hobby, is it's not always fun to be enjoyable. Does that work? They're kind of the same words. It's, 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 a, lot like, it's a lot like in, in, in role-playing, where sometimes you're going to lose a character, and the first time you do, it's tough, but... You get used to it. It's something that happens, and it allows you to move on and enjoy the game in other ways. You're enjoying playing the game, not winning the game or beating the game. It's the playing is is the the fun. Exactly, the the playing and well, the interactions with the people at the table. To me, Absolutely. that's what makes this hobby so much better than video games. Not to bash on the video game players, which I really shouldn't do on Twitch or like ban us or something. Um, but it's the face-to-face, -face, the actual interaction at the table, the the sharing of food, the you're snacking, you're there. It's hey, now let's not get into the food. That's for next week's episode. <laughs> well, that's quite, I think it's the week after, but yes, good point. So getting back on topic, going back to last week. So then last Saturday, I went out to Brimstone Games, a uh, local game store, friendly local game store. Yes, the F fits. They are a friendly local game store uh, for one of their game nights. They host twice a month. Now, you say you say their game nights, but you should take a little bit of credit for that, right? Uh, I mean, this is Windsor well, after all. <laughs> that, that is true. Um, yeah, for people who know me from before I was the Table Tale Pell Hop, I was uh, Windsor Gaming. I was the local gaming ambassador. And yes, 
I, I definitely can't take all the credit, but I did help Brimstone Games set up their game night. I helped them determine the format, um, help drive people there. I helped advertise it. Um, I say um a lot. I'll have to remember to stop doing that. So part of what we set up at Brimstone to get people in is we have a ticket system. So when you show up, you get a ticket just for showing up. If you bring games for other people to play, you get a ticket. That was one of my contributions because any local game night, yes, you want to show off whatever the demo game is, whatever the cool game of the night is, but you also just want people to come out, have fun and play games. <laughs> and there's an awful lot of can't find players to play. This is the perfect opportunity for people to take those games, bring them out, find other local players and get them to the table, which is way better than sitting on your shelves. So you get a ticket for bringing games to teach other people to play. Now I mentioned demo games. Every night has a featured game. So that's something that the store is showing off. Usually it's something new and hot. Sometimes it's something they've had on the shelves for a while they want to move. That is 100% up to them. They, they made that decision. They decide what game to demo. If you demo the demo game, so you sit down and play a copy, you get a ticket. Then there's the very important to the store part, support the store. Buy a snack, buy food, buy drinks, buy a game. Actually, buying a game is the main thing they want you to do while you're there. So they give you five tickets for buying a game. Makes sense. Reward the behavior you want to see. So then everyone plays, you play games, you collect tickets. Then at 8 p.m. they have a draw and then they give away a gift card for the store based on how many people showed up to the event. So if only like six of us show up and we've got one table, yeah, maybe we get five bucks to come back, whatever. But we get a good 30, 40 people out. They're really happy about this, right? We're supporting the store. They're giving us a place to play. It's awesome. They give away a better, better gift card. Sounds great. So what did we play down at uh, what did we play down at Brimstone this week? Oh, yeah. Back on target. <laughs> First game we played was Bruges. I I any well uh, respecting game player. No, that's not a good way to word it. That's shooting down some people. Um, game players who play a lot of hobby games know the name Stefan Feld. He is literally my favorite game designer. He is one of the best game designers in the world and he has an extensive catalog. Many people consider Bruges to be his best game. My bit of shame is I had not played it until Saturday night. Thankfully, I was able to get a copy when Geektropolis, how I miss you, uh, went out of business. Sad, but at least I got a copy of Bruges. Um, nonetheless, Bruges is a fantastic game. There's a reason people consider it one of Feld's best. Now, the part that will break some people's minds who don't know the game is it's a quick Stefan Feld. Those words usually don't go together. Stefan Feld's known for having point salad games where there's lots of ways to earn points. This is a point salad game that you can play in about an hour. I was extremely impressed. Impressive. Now this ties in with Zanguo a bit in that it also has multi-use cards. And from what I can tell, it's one of the first games to have multi-use cards. So you have cards of different colors that can do different things. So when you get the card in your hand, you can use it to do six different things that's listed down the side of the card, or you can use it to build a house, or you can play it as a person who lives in one of the houses. Without explaining the full game, it's neat to make those decisions, and those are hard decisions, and there are a lot of decision points. As I said, it's a heavier game. It's a Steffenfeld. It was fantastic. I look forward to playing it more. And then, going back to Zanguo, and again, coming full circle, since we started the game week with Zanguo, I ended it with Zanguo. Mainly because of that whole extreme version. I was a little frustrated we played the wrong way and wanted to make sure the game was good, putting it to the table playing properly. So we played Zanguo again. Uh, I've already talked about it a bit. Fantastic, abstract, but very thematically abstract somehow. Like it, it just works. You're unifying China by doing three things. You're going out to the five different provinces. You are trying to teach the people a common language. You are teaching them to write, you are putting in a common currency, and you are setting a set of codified laws. Everything you do towards doing that, which is usually sending officials to one of the five provinces, gets you little markers that show how much you've contributed to doing each thing. And then there's markers in each color. So it's a marker for writing, a marker for coinage, and a marker for laws. So you play through a whole year and then the emperor rewards the people who did each of those things best each round. But then it becomes, what did you do for me lately? Because you lose those. And then next year you have to impress the emperor again. 
all the same while you're trying to decide who to send to court, where to put your people, and then you have to hire workers, which pisses off the people, so they start to revolt, so then you have to hire governors to keep the people in check, and so on. Like I said, Abstract Games does a really good job of simplifying, simulating the unification of China. It's from What's Your Game, I strongly recommend it. All right. Well, I'm looking in our uh, chat room right now, and things are uh, starting to, to pick up. I'd like to thank Dragon Gem for dropping in. Seeing a lot of chatter about uh, some different legacy games right now, with uh, Charterstone, Gloomhaven, and Seafall being mentioned. I will admit, right now, I'm trying to focus on this, so I haven't been reading the chat. What was the comment on Seafall? I'm curious, because that one is a very polarizing game. Well, uh, Dragon Gem has really enjoyed that so far. So we'll uh, looks and it looks like uh, it's cheap to pick up a second copy if you need to restart after uh, a failed group, as it appears uh, some people have had. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I was thinking about being one of those people who had a failed group. We played till about uh, session seven or so, and then had someone rage quit, never wanting to play it again. And I've I've heard other groups with the same problem. It's it's an I don't know. I'm on the fence about it. My wife loves it. My friend Eugene loves it until he gets robbed by pirates, but it generally loves it. And then my friend Neil refuses to ever play again. And see, so, I, yeah, thought I, mean, me, I thought Eugene would love being robbed by pirates, but maybe that's a whole different episode. Uh, yeah, perhaps. <laughs> uh, and hello to yeah. uh, BP Kurtz in the chat room as well. Another uh, voice popping up. Uh, but uh, we've... Uh, we're moving on, and so now we're going to get into our actual Ask the Bellhop portion of the show. Now, this is where we take questions from various sources, and uh, we uh, from questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or if you go over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop, there's a variety of ways to get in touch with us. Uh, we're here to... Yep. <laughs> we need your questions. We're here to help you, but we can't help if we don't know what's wrong. And to start things off on this inaugural episode, Aaron asks, I've heard that Catan is awesome to play, and every time I happen to check out at our local shop, there are new additions popping up. What is this game about that there can be so many iterations of it, and where do I begin if I want to learn how to play? Thanks for your help. Well, thank you, Aaron, for your question. I'm sure a lot of game lovers have this very same concern. The Catan franchise is a real gateway game to modern board gaming, but a daunting shelf Full of material to see at your local gaming store. All right. Originally, the game was called Settlers of Catan. Mine all say Settlers. That branched off. There was the game Settlers of Catan, and it 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 kind of exploded. It at one time was probably the most popular hobby game in the world. It still might be. It's just not ranked number one. Like not just like expansions there were expansions and then there were standalone games and then there was stuff called Catan that wasn't Catan then there were knockoffs like the biblical version settlers of Canaan like it is nuts like Aaron has a good point if you walked into a store and there was a Catan section it would take an entire aisle it's crazy how much is there so first Aaron thank you for the question uh, I'm not sure if you're listening but if you do uh, if you're not, I have answered the question over on the blog. So if you head over to tabletopbellhop.com, there you will find my original answer to this. So first was Catan. The basic thing that is the same in every game of Catan is you start off with your first settlements. It's, it's your first initial placement on the board. So you have a couple spots that are yours. Every player has those. You roll some dice, the dice gen generate resources. That's based on where those settlements are and what numbers come up on the dice. Once you have resources, you then use them to build stuff. You build stuff to get points, you get enough points, you win. What Catan is, is a race. You are trying to get to a set number of points quicker than anyone else. In the standard game, that's 10 points, but that changes with every version. Every version of Catan I've ever played has that same starting positions, roll dice, get resources, build stuff to get points. That's the same every time. The other thing that's common to every game of Catan is trading. Now, this is the thing that puts it a step above most games. Those resources you get, you can freely trade with the other players. This makes the game highly interactive. 
It also leads to bad jokes like wood and sheep and no, we won't go there. Okay, so family show. There was Catan. Yeah. Family show, we hope. If you hear the bell on the podcast, that means Mo or Sean said something bad. Um, so you start off at the beginning, you build out. So there's basic Catan. You're settling an island. Your settlements are settlements. You're going to build roads to connect them. You're going to get points for having the longest road. There's also these development cards. So things you can develop. You, you can have a monopoly and steal resources from other players. The little ways you can break the games and some give you points. Then they came out with Seafarers of Catan. That just added a little bit to the base game. It's my favorite expansion for this. Because all it did was take the board that was one island and make it a board with a bunch of islands. And there's a couple different ways to set it up. And then give you the ability to build boats. Other than that, you now have longest trade route instead of longest road. It's still Catan. It plays the same. You just have these neat new rules. It still feels the same. That's what I love about it. Then they put out Cities and Knights of Catan. Now, this time, they made it more complex. They made it a heavier game. You've got barbarians coming in from the north trying to raid it. So you want to build city walls. You can build knights. You then, in addition to building your cities, you have uh, like a technology tra- chain, a tree, technology tree, where you can upgrade different parts of your cities that all modify the basic Catan rules. So you get extra resources or you can move your knights more spots. So you're getting a, so you're getting a little bit civilization here once you get into these the, the, the bigger expansions like that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Like, t- to me, it's, it's civilization's a good example. You get parts of civilization. You're, you're not, uh, you've got the tech tree part of it. You are still expanding. You've got the whole 4X thing, but you're not really fighting against each other. You're fighting the barbarians. So in addition to the rule changes, you also get points for a lot more things. So if you max out one of the three tech trees, you get points. If you defeat the barbarians, you get points. If you fail to defeat the barbarians, some people lose points. It's it's much more complicated. Now, I know a ton of people that think it's a way better game because of that. These are the people that call Catan farm, because all you do is you're farming, you're trading resources, you're getting bigger. It's so boring. Why am I? Oh, cities and knights, there's barbarians coming, and I can build knights, and I can move them around. To each their own. The one cool thing about these expansions is they're all interchangeable. So I can play Catan. I can play Catan with cities and knights. I can play Catan with seafarers and cities and knights. Now, that's about when I stopped following along with Catan, but since then, they've also put out traders and barbarians and pirates and merchants... Wow, I should have had this up. There's one more. I apologize for not having the name. It's in on the blog post. But they did put out another expansion. And again, these modify the base Catan game. And then they put out a set. Well, not then, but they also have a set of all of those expansions. You can buy an extra box that lets you play with more players. You can get the Seafarers version and so on. But all of that is just still basic Catan. So then there's the standalone games. There's one Aaron mentions, which is the Game of Thrones Catan. Another very popular one is the Star Trek Catan. Then there's other spin-offs. There's um, Railways of America, which is it's under the brand Catan Histories. Uh, there's oh, there's so many of them. <laughs> Basically, what they are is they're standalone games that use the Catan system but they don't work with all the expansions and everything else. So what they do is they take the base Catan game and they add in something new. So for example, the Star Trek one gives you the crew. So you play Catan, but then you have a deck of, I think seven crew. I may be wrong on that. You shuffle them up and every player gets a crew. So someone will have Kirk, someone will have Spot, someone will have Bones. And anyone who's a real fan of the game is probably gonna get mad at me getting this wrong because I don't know exactly which one does. But like during my turn, in addition to getting my resources and getting my stuff and building my roads, oh, good point. You don't build roads, get to that in a second. You play a card and it breaks the rules in some way. So Spock may be like use logic to collect resources from the other players. Who knows? I don't know offhand. I don't own Star Trek team. Uh, the other thing that they often do is change the theme. So Star Trek does this where it'll change the name. So instead of wood, you'll be picking up dilithium. And instead of building cities and settlements, you'll be building star bases. Got to stay and on brand somehow. Exactly. Instead of roads, you actually build um, space lanes, right? So jumping over to the Game of Thrones version, in that one, you hire watchers to watch the wall and then at the end of the turn wild things attack the wall and you have to defend the wall where you lose points but other than that it plays just like Catan 
one of the neat things about that version is you can play basic Catan with that version and not add the Game of Thrones element. So you're almost getting two games in one, which I thought was kind of cool. That was something I didn't realize until doing the research for this. So those are standalone games. They're still Catan, but they do their own thing. Everyone changes the rules in some unique way. They run slightly differently, but they still feel the same. So it's a little bit like the branded versions of Monopoly or Snakes and Ladders or everything else. If you want to get yeah. Disney Monopoly, you can get Disney Monopoly and they'll have different properties or whatever it is and different characters to play. It's still Monopoly, but it's been branded differently and you're going to get a slightly different experience because of that. Aimed at a different market. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, the only addition I would change is... The Monopoly ones in particular don't seem to ever change the rules. They might change the name of the chance deck or something. It's These usually do have at least one new rule. Like I said, for Star Trek, you've got the cards. For Game of Thrones, you're building the wall. For Settlers of America, you're building trains going out west, and your cities move because they're wagon trains that move along the road as you go. So a lot little change the rules, but yes, the Monopoly analogy fits. It's It's a branded version of the game. Then there's the messed up stuff. So the weird stuff you get here, which I'm gonna grab. Oh, my headphones won't reach that far. That is my stack of Catan. Uh, it's Starship Catan. This is a two player only game where you put a starship in front of you. You spend your resources to upgrade your ship and add new components. So you are still spending resources. You roll a single D6 to figure out which of your component sections go off. But then to find stuff, you pick between sets of tiles that represent different sections of space, and you're going to draw the top so many tiles and pick the one you discover. And then you put the stack back after you've interacted with it. So there's a memory element to the game, so you're trying to remember where the trading posts are to get different resources. You can't trade with the other player. That's not even part of the game. So to me, the only thing Katana in there is I'm going to roll a die to determine if I get anything off my board. There's no settlements. There's no route building. So they've really they've really kind of run with the name and said, hey, people will buy anything Katan. We have a fun game here because it's a, I think it is a fun game. I mean, I've, I played it yeah. a couple of times. It's a great game. It's just using the name of Katan to get into the market because it's not Katan. Yeah, I, <laughs> I agree. I agree in that case. Now there's Starfarers of Catan, which I wish wasn't out of print, that feels a bit more like Catan, because you've got a big map, it's got hexes, they're not a hex board. You start off from your starting system and you go out and you find planets, and when you settle them, they get numbers on them, and you roll 2d6, and if those numbers come up and you have a star base there, you get resources. So that part's Catan. But then other than that, they came up with one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen, where you have this plastic spaceship. I was hoping to grab one out, but... It's behind me. You have this plastic starship where you actually snap components onto it to show how upgraded your ship is. And then the messed up part is you flip it over and then put it down and little balls fall to the bottom into this catch basin. And that tells you how far you can move. We are trying to keep this a, a family show, so I'm going to avoid commenting <laughs> any further on that. <laughs> so, oh, and what I was just going to say was just going to make it worse. Um, then you... I can't help it. Then you look at the balls to see what color they are. Oh, you've broken me. This is not good. So you look at the components that follow to the bottom of your ship. And if any of those is black, you have an encounter. This adds a very cool, almost RPG experience as the player to your left grabs a deck of cards, takes the top card, reads it part way, and says something like, you have encountered a group of the Lassie prisoners. Their ship looks damaged. Do you wish to approach? And then the player will decide what they want to do. And it usually involves rolling dice and then using the components on your ship. So like in that case, it might be roll a d6 and add your terraforming rings. If you get a seven or higher, something happens. If you get seven less, something else happened. So then the person next to you will tell you what happened to you. So Catan kind of, but not really. All right. Very cool game. All right. Uh, so, I think we've done quite the overview of, uh, of Catan here, but again, for even more detail, we have answered this question, uh, on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com with much more detail from the bellhop. Uh, and, so, yeah, yeah, moving on. <laughs> we, uh, 
one of us talks too fast. I'm not sure which it is. We're at half an hour in and we're hoping for a 45 minute episode. So yeah, you does anyone in the chat room have any questions about Catan or anyone say anything? All right, no, we're uh, we're a little quiet now. Uh, I know BP Kurtz was looking to see if the Seafarers of Catan was worth checking out, and you seem to have some good things to say about it. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. If I had to buy, there's a good point I missed. If I had to buy right now any version of Catan and I didn't already own a pile of them, I personally would go with the base game, and then the next thing I would buy would be Seafarers. But then there's a caveat to that. The best game you own is the game that gets to the table. If you can't find people to play the game, it's a terrible game. It doesn't matter how good the mechanics are, how cool the miniatures are, how well made it is, who the designer is. If it doesn't get to the table, who cares? No one's playing the game. It's it, it's, a, it's a pile of junk. It's it's Well, unless you're a collector and want to show off your pile of Catan, it's not any use to you unless you get it to the table. So if your group really digs defending the wall like that sounds cooler than being a farmer and trading wood for sheep it's go for it right pick up the uh, game of thrones version if your group really likes star trek and wants to pretend they're the bridge crew and trade around cards and trade dilithium for i don't know the other thing carbon to uh build space lanes instead of building roads go for that but if you're just interested in pure mechanics and expandability I'd say go for the base game. It's still a fantastic game. It came out a long time ago. I'm still playing it to this day. It's been a little while, I'll admit, but I have no problem playing Catan. And then to make it a little more interesting, add in Seafarers. Seafarers still feels like Catan. Okay, we've got a great question here from BP Kurtz. How long does it take for a total newbie to grok the rules of Catan? Oh, yeah. The thing with board games nowadays, they are popular enough, you should be able to find someone to teach you. If you can get someone to teach you, I would say like 15 minutes, maybe half an hour at the most. Now, if you're going to sit down and read the Catan rulebook, it's probably going to take a bit, especially if you're a complete noob, because there's going to be terms you're not used to. But if someone, if I sat down with Catan and had the hex grid out in front of you and showed you how to play, I'm thinking 15 minutes tops for you to get the basic gameplay. In one play, you'll have some basic strategies. Now, mastering the game, that's completely different. There's a reason that there are worldwide Catan tournaments that people go to to play for money. Uh, local gamer Charles Frank at the Tecumseh Cornfrest runs a Catan tournament that's extremely popular every year with prizes the whole bit. Like, this game's like, just like chess, there's chess tournaments, there are Catan tournaments, people take it that seriously. But to know the basic mechanics, like really it's not hard. It's here's your starting settlement, here's your roads, I'm gonna roll dice, you look at where the dice rolled, oh, it's an eight, do I have any stuff on eight? If I have stuff on eight, I get stuff. Then I use that to build stuff, you look at a card, it's gotta list everything you can build, and you know you get points for building settlements and cities. Hey, I might wanna build those. Like it's really not a hard game. So, Here's a question for you. We've got esports tournaments now. They're literally building arenas for people to play video games in. Why do we not have... We have chess tournaments broadcast live on ESPN. Why do we not have the same... With Catan's growing uh, power and interest in the market, uh, are you surprised that we haven't seen that sort of level of competition in Catan? Or in, in other, any other board game, for that matter? Anything Fantasy Flight is broadcast they do the whole thing you can watch the x-wing championships you can watch armada uh you can watch imperial assault yes those are all star wars but the, the fancy flight games have popped in my head um there are companies doing it i just think it's not well known yet okay now right now we're sitting on twitch so this is a really good example if you don't, don't do it now <laughs> once you're done watching this show check out the board game channel and see how many people are out there streaming their games now, we mentioned Brimstone Games earlier. They have one table in their store set up with a camera on the ceiling, set up with play mats. They broadcast games. Now, I've never seen anyone do Catan, but I do know the Catan World Championships are broadcast. Okay. The thing with Catan is it's popular here, but it's not nearly as popular as in Europe, specifically in Germany where it came out. Right. That all happens there. So in Germany, from what I understand, there's people who sit on Saturday night and can watch people play Catan. Right. Never done it myself. 
And no, for the chat room who's in the know, we are not going to comment on the D&D eSports thing that leaked this week. I am not talking about that on this show. <laughs> Understandable. Uh, Dragon Gem brings up the good point. There are digital versions of Catan. Uh, are, there, are, there, are there good versions and bad versions? Are there licenses and unlicenses? Where do you, where do you go if uh, you want to play Catan online or uh, on your mobile device? Oh yeah, this might upset some people, but no, just just no. It's it's a trading game. How how do you trade with people? How do I bluff? Like that's half the fun at Catan. If you just want the pure mechanics, yes, you can play it online. But I, I've tried. I owned it on Xbox, like just Xbox, not 361. I bought it back on Xbox, and I was like, this is so dry. It is not fun. I have like a little symbol shows up. Someone wants to trade, and it shows two pictures of sheep. And I'm like, I can't like read the guy's face to see if he really needs the sheep or if he's willing to give me three sheep maybe. You lose so much. So that said, my personal opinion, not for me. Um, and because of that, I couldn't really tell you what's the best way to play nowadays. My suggestion, if you want to play digital, is find one of the many sites that let you play the actual game with video and chat. So it's more of a thing. So, um, so a streaming a streaming version of the board game, basically. Uh, right. There, there's something. Oh, what is it called? Tabletop something virtual. There's a virtual tabletop version. Okay. I'm totally blanking on the word for it. All right. Well, we can find that and we can throw it in our show links for uh, updating on the blog when the podcast goes live. Sounds good. Uh, uh, so you would, what about learning? Is, is, are the uh, digital versions a great uh, way to learn? BP Kurtz is, uh, is asking in the, the chat room. Oh, yeah. That, that's probably a, a good point. I will admit, remember I talked about Raw playing the extreme version? The way I learned that we weren't playing properly is I downloaded the app for my iPhone and I was like, whoa, wait a minute, what's it doing during the scoring? And I was like, oh, we don't play that way. Let me go grab the rule book. Oh, wow, we have been playing wrong for years. Yes, so yeah, that's a good point, BP or Brian, whatever we're, we're going with. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, there, there's actually, from what I hear the the Playing online is the best way to learn to play through the ages, which is one of the heavier, more complex games. Going back to what Sean mentioned about Civ games, it's considered the best. And I've been told by many people the way to learn that game is to play it. And I would assume it'd be the same for Catan. Excellent. Now, talking about digital versions and this game that often comes up with Catan, now, if you can get the app of Carcassonne, that is fantastic. There's no bluffing, there's no chatting. Just playing your tiles in the right place, that is a great cutthroat game that is fantastic on the app. All right. Excellent. And uh, we're allowed to call him Brian or BP, apparently. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I'm like, I'm looking at your name in front of me, and Sean's <laughs> reading it off the chat, and it's somewhere else. Absolutely. Uh, so, speaking of Brian, we've got a Patreon right. shout-out. So, just a reminder to everyone listening, everyone likes a good tipper. If you head over to our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop and support us at the good tip or better level, your questions get bumped to the top of the list. Just a little added perk, and, and that's at the $2 level. And speaking of Patreon, we've got a shout out and thank you to our backers, who is Brian Kurtz. Thank you very much for your support of this show uh, as we begin our, our journey. It's great to, uh, great to know that someone's paying attention. And, uh, and right now, that is it. <laughs> I would love to add more names to this list. That would be fantastic. Again, just head over to patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. All one word. All right. And uh, that seems to be about the end of our Catan topic for the night. So... So coming up next week, uh, I just released a new blog post today. Uh, going back to that whole Patreon questions get asked first, I answered Brian's question today. We'll save the full topic for the next podcast or live show. But if you head over to the blog, you can see the post where I talk about children's games, specifically co-op children's games and lesser known ones. So not your pandemic um through the desert or sorry forbidden island the ones most people know but i try to think of some that people 
haven't heard of before. So you can see that live on the blog now. That's uh, tabletopbellhop.com. And if you join us next Thursday, we'll be talking about that live. Again, we're going to try and go live every Thursday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, and uh, we'll, if you keep an eye on the Twitters, we're at Tabletop Bellhop on, the, uh, on Twitter and on G+. Uh, we, have the, we have a uh, community on G+, for Tabletop Bellhop. We're Tabletop Bellhop on Facebook and Instagram as well. Uh, and if we need to make changes in our schedule... We'll put posting to all those uh, various social media events uh, and likely on to the patron, uh, patron uh, blog as well so that we can let uh, those people know and thank them. In general, anywhere you look on the web and you search for Tabletop Bellhop, you should find us. And actually, if you search somewhere and don't find us, let me know and I'll get us there. Well, look at the time. My shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us on the web and social media. Again, it's Tabletop Bellhop, all one word. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or click on Ask the Bellhop on tabletopbellhop.com where you can also find regular posts, including detailed answers to questions, game reviews, the week in review, week in review and more, including these blo- the uh, podcasts when they go live. And don't forget the three master lists I've been compiling. This is something I started over at Google Plus that is going to be moving over to Tabletop Bellhop. I'm going to have a list of tabletop gaming podcasts, a list of tabletop Patreons, and a new one similarly themed for Twitch channels, which I probably should add this one. All right. And if you like the content we're providing and you'd like to support our efforts, please go tip the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. All patrons get access to our show notes, the penthouse suite after chat conversations, outtakes and behind the scenes blog posts, and more. Great tippers, those backing up $4 or more, also get access to our private Slack channel where you can hang out with myself, Sean, and other fans of the show. There's also a couple other concierge-based services I offer over the Patreon, and go check those out. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the live show tonight. For those of you here live in the Twitch, We welcome you to join us in the penthouse suite for an off-the-books, after-the-show get-together. For the Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. We'll see you next time.